Come on. They're right there. Let's go. Move, 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 move. This episode of Choices Not Chances podcast is sponsored by Louisiana Gun Shop. Located on Highway 90 West in Broussard, Louisiana, just south of Lafayette. For more information, stay tuned at the end of this episode. This is Choices Not Chances podcast with Ryan and Matt. I'm your co-host, Matthew Charette. Sitting next to me is Ryan Rogers. Ryan. Hey, welcome back, everybody. This week's episode is with the host of Combat Story, Ryan Fugit. I first met Ryan when I recorded with him for his podcast several months ago, and I had such a great time and we had great conversation that I wanted to get the chance to get him into the hot seat, ask him a few questions as I was intrigued about, you know, the small amount of information that I learned during conversation, uh, you know, in the interview with him. Ryan talks about his decision to serve coming from hearing the heroic Silver Star stories of his father as he grew up and as a young man. He also speaks to the stories he would hear from his uncle, who was also in the service, and his brothers as they became pilots. Being a pilot was simply in their blood. Ryan graduated from flight school at the top of his class, and he earned the ability to select his platform. His hard work paid off, and he became an Apache pilot. We discuss his career as a pilot flying in the Badlands and his follow-on career with the Central Intelligence Agency. He is simply an inspiration to all that come in contact with him and his work with veterans through podcasting is impeccable. If you haven't checked out Combat Story Podcast yet, you should. You should do that now. Without further delay, Mr. Ryan Fugit. Ryan Fugit, thanks for coming out. Uh, Appreciate you coming on. Oh man, I'm so happy to be here. Returning the favor. Thank you for coming on our show. Uh, People loved it, so I'm happy to be here, man. Yeah, I had an, I had a good time and uh and the conversation was so good when we were talking. I'm like I got to I want to do this more. This is um I've done I've done some podcasts and it's no hit to anybody else, but there was just uh I don't know if it was a chemistry or because we were you know both talking about something that meant something to us in the past, but yeah. uh, you know, I really enjoyed the conversation. So I appreciate sure. you coming on with me and uh let me ask some questions. Let's do it, man. I hate being on this side, if I'm being honest, but it's different, isn't I, it? <laughs> we gotta do it. We gotta do it, man. I owe you. That's funny. I just, I just knocked my cameras around, but we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and kick to it. So, um, what I like to start with generally is, uh, like we talked about offline, I like to know where people come from. Like, what, who, how did you get set up for to to become who you have become? And so, what I like to know is, um going all the way back, you know, to early days, childhood, uh, were both parents in the house, uh, how many siblings and where you are in the pecking order, uh, team sports and then religion as you grew up, were those things that were big in the house? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the, the sibling part is going to take just a little bit longer, but I hope you'll bear with me because it's really important for the military aspect of my life. Um, so I, I grew up with both parents in the house. We lived all over the world because my dad was a uh, State Department officer. Um, so he was a Huey pilot in Vietnam and then spent the 30 years after that in the State Department. So we lived in embassies all over the place. But my my dad was working. My mom was kind of stay-at-home mom, um, which was fairly typical, I would say, for that time. Um, but very supportive, loving household. And then I had... I have three older brothers, two biological and a half brother. So the oldest one is a half brother who was given up for adoption um, early on. And this is where it's slightly complicated, but very interesting. Where my dad ended up telling me and my two biological older brothers that we had another brother out there somewhere. But when they gave him up for adoption, they set it up so this uh, boy would not find his biological parents again. Hmm. Um, So when we all turned, I think it was... 15, my dad told us, Hey, there's somebody else out there in case it ever comes up. Right. When I turned 15, my dad told me that. And within a year, this guy found my dad. So my dad was a Huey pilot in Vietnam. I have a brother, one of my biological brothers who was a, uh, an armor officer in the army pre nine 11. And then myself, I went into aviation. This half brother who never met us was a Kiowa pilot. (laughs) kid out so he wow without any 
connection to my family went into the army, not like some other branch, into the army and flew helicopters. And so he fin he did a career there. We're very close now. I just went to wow. my nephew, his son's uh, wedding. His son is a second lieutenant in the army who's at ranger school, probably <laughs> getting his ass kicked right now and, and enjoying every minute of it. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we're really close. I just think there's something as you talk about family. I don't know how deep the genes are, but... Like they're strong because this guy found his way there anyway. Yeah, it's very, I mean, that's an interesting story, but it's very interesting. Um, like when you look at somebody's lineage and it seemingly goes this way, you can have that. Maybe it's a gene or maybe it's a, I don't think, I don't think it could be a gene, but it's something because that does happen and it, it happens in professional sports. It happens in state department work. It happens in military style work. And it's like, we're all supposed to be somebody, right? And yeah. and we figure out who that's supposed to be along the way, I guess. Can, so to, that's a crazy your, story. Yeah, it is, man. And to your, and we're very close. We're all very close. So to your question on siblings, I I always say I have three older brothers. I I treat them all the same, like I grew up with them. Sure. I am the youngest in the pecking order, though. So, and I have three sons myself. Okay. And it's very similar. Um, personality, I would say, for my sons and the way I grew up with my brothers. So there's a bit of an age gap, uh, six years between me and my next closest older brother. Um, so we grew up around each other, but I was very much not supposed to get around them. Like, was going to mess up what they had going on with their buddies and the girls. Oh, yeah. But they, I mean, they were good. They were good to me. But we grew up overseas, so it was a little bit odd. When we when they got to high school, they had to go back to the U.S. So I was kind of alone with my parents in Africa, the Middle East, while they were in boarding school in high school. Mm -hmm. So they influenced who I am today for sure. But I didn't have them around as much as I would have if I grew up with, I guess, more of a traditional like U.S. based sure. experience. Sure. Yeah, I get that. And I... then, yeah. No, go ahead. I was just going to say for religion, I grew up very Catholic, mm -hmm. um, altar boy, just through and through my old man was very, to this day is very religious. Um, I lost that in Afghanistan. Like I came back, not religious at the end of that tour. Um, but I grew up very Catholic, went to a public high school, but ended up going to Georgetown university, which is a, a Jesuit school. Mm -hmm. So like my freshman year, we had a, a Jesuit priest on every floor and we'd go in, he'd come have a beer with us when we're 18. Cause he knew like, we're going to do it anyway, but it may as well be a part of the community and talk to us and hang out. So, um, I've always had like a very strong appreciation for the church and, and the direction it gave me, but I very much lost that in Afghanistan. And then the other really strong component of my childhood was sports. Um, because I grew up overseas, I started playing, odd sports for the u.s like i grew up playing rugby <laughs> mm -hmm. um squash swimming weird sports um a lot of ping pong which helped me later <laughs> on which we could talk about at the i don't know what the cia does to screen people but one of the underlying common denominators <laughs> has to be ping pong skill because oh, yeah. it's intense competition <laughs> man like um it. anyway so i grew up playing those <clears throat> those different sports and when i came back to the u.s i was 13 at the time um, first time back in America for good. And I couldn't wait to play football. I read Friday Night Lights, that book back in the day, like oh, about yeah. football in Texas. And I was like, how do I get myself into this? So eighth grade, first first year back in the US, I was like, I'll go and play football. So I played football, did track, some wrestling. I, I hesitate to even say that I wrestled because I was so bad at it. <laughs> but um, I did that just to be part of the the community and that, that team and camaraderie. Sure. And then I played football in college at Georgetown's 1AA. So I played there for four years. Again, I can't say that I played much, but you know, I very much appreciated being part of that team. So football has been a large part of my life from the beginning, or at least football and rugby. I still watch rugby to this day. Sure, sure. Now, um, two things. One thing I want to circle back to loss of faith in Afghanistan. We can come back to that later. Um, but as far as... Uh, coming back to the states is that different you know you said 13 that's an impressionable age anyway and then you're coming back and now were you did you have did you have trouble assimilating did it, did it seem different coming back in so it, it was different 
I had moved, you know, from like Europe to Africa to Pakistan. So like I had had some serious culture changes over mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. And I do think all of this served me very well at the CIA where you have sure. to like quickly get to know people and, and level set and build rapport. So I, I kind of had that, I think, coming back to the U.S. And I played sports, which just felt like such a huge advantage because if you can compete, you're immediately part of a, a community of people. Some tribe will be there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I had that right off the bat, but it was a bit of a jump. Like the schools internationally that all the Americans and expats and the locals send, like the rich locals send their kids to are very good. So I kind of came back and was in not the greatest schooling system, public school in Florida. Great story. Uh, in in our classes, before I got moved into like the the more advanced classes, when they realized, all right, this guy could probably compete at another level here. Mm-hmm. Um, like I'd look around and, and kids would just be playing spades in class. They'd uh-huh. be doing whatever they wanted while class was going on. And one of those guys was Channing Tatum, who's an actor now. Yeah. Um, Went on to play G.I. Joe, which just irked me to no end because I grew up like loving that. Was in the army at the time. And I was like, this guy's going to play. I love I love him. He's a great dude. But he was in my class at the time. So it was very much a culture shock. Like he went on to be a stripper and then yeah. an actor. You know, I went on to like straight and narrow line yeah. down to the army. Um, so it was a bit of a shock. But Magic Mike and that's right, CIA man. helicopter. Yeah. yeah come it from the same route. wider. <laughs> um, but no, it, it was an all right assimilation. It wasn't too hard. And I was dying to get to America, man. Like I just reading Friday Night Lights, watching the Gulf War from afar. We take a trip once a year. I'd see the U.S. for a couple of weeks, like I, just to watch baseball games. Like I couldn't wait to get back. Mm-hmm. So I was excited for that. Now, let me back up again because I missed something there. It's, talk to me, okay, and like, and I know, I, I don't know how your memory is. My memory is a little bit shot once I go back a certain distance. But talk to me about what you remember living in Africa and living in Pakistan. I, I probably didn't appreciate it as much as I should have at the time. So my dad was pretty high up on the totem pole at that point in time. Like I was his youngest kid, so he was pretty far advanced in his career at that time. So we lived well like most people do in the third world when you're an American. Sure. Um, But one of the really memorable things for me in Africa was my mom would take me with her to orphanages when she'd go and just like volunteer and help out. Mm -hmm. And so there's something, I think you and I were talking about this, Ryan, when we did our interview last time, which was there's something about seeing the third world for the first time that makes you really realize how good you got it as Mm -hmm. an American, whether you're in the U.S. or not. And that was like that first point in my life, I was probably seven years old, where I was really thinking, I have it really good here where I am. Um, so I kind of saw that and I, I fell in love with Africa. I think a lot of people who go to Africa have trouble leaving it um, and forgetting about it. And it's really sad because we lived in Zimbabwe and that place is torn to shreds now, just mm-hmm. so poorly managed. It's you know, dangerous to go back. And one day I'd love to still go back there, but like Victoria Falls is there. They have great heritage sites wildlife so i loved it there um actually the guy who lived next door to us was the real life if you've seen the james bond movies the guy who makes all the gadgets oh yeah that was him so he did that in a previous life so i'd always (laughs) go over to this dude's house me and his kid would run around and like check out what he what he had worked on and little tools that he had Um, and then pakistan was slightly different for me so we got there in 90 1990 My dad was high up. He was number three guy at the embassy. And it's a big embassy. So when the Gulf War kicked off, they evacuated us all out. So my my mom, my brother, and I got evacuated back to Chicago for six months. Okay. And so it was pretty impressionable. Yeah, I was about 11 years old. When we came back to Pakistan, they hated us. They hated Americans. Like whatever sentiment that was built up at the school with like the local kids, they really disliked us. So I had a, a formative event where I went to a school dance. I was in seventh grade. I was dancing with an American girl who was of Egyptian descent. And these local kids had their bodyguards pull me out back. I put a gun to my head and they said, hey, you dance with another Muslim girl again, we're going to kill you. Um, so another event like that happened not too long after that. So we got pulled out of that place and came back to the U.S. Um, so, yeah, I bet that's hard to forget uh, about. Yeah, I didn't leave on the greatest of terms, 
but I still appreciated it there. It was the first Muslim country I'd lived in, like the call to prayer. They have a huge mosque in Islamabad called Faisal Mosque that I remember going to to check out. Food was incredible. Um, you know, I, I appreciated that lifestyle, I think, and, yeah. and the community. So overall, it was positive. I remember a bit, you know, it was formative until I was about 13. And then we came to the U.S. Check. Now, what happened? What, where did this, the, the American uh, sentiment go? Oh, for those kids? Yeah. I think they saw the U.S. in Saudi. I mean, mm. even though we were kind of helping push Iraq out, um, they just saw us on their lands. There was something about that feeling, at least within, within Pakistan, that did not want to see that happen. Mm. And they evacuated us out because they were afraid that the embassy might get overrun, which had happened there before. So it wasn't unheard of for that sentiment to change. Yeah. Yeah, that's wild, especially at a young age. Um, but but like you said, does that bode well for the the later Ryan that you become? Probably in a big way, right? To have yeah, international sure. experience in your you know young teens and living outside the country, I think that probably bodes real well. Absolutely. Awesome, awesome. So, kick, okay, so kick into. It sounds like you have a lineage of people that's ripe with service do you think that's where it comes from especially when you when you when you talked about your your brother uh having nothing to do with you and still drawn to the army still drawn to the to the kiowa some 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 sort of platform being the same as you your brother your dad um is there any other main catalyst that turned something in you or or was that just kind of what it was going to be so again for my for my half brother like, I don't know how he ended up there, but for us, it was heavily influenced by my old man. Um, I remember just sitting, watching hit, like looking on the mantle. He had a very small plaque that had a silver star, a distinguished flying cross from his time in Nam. You know, and I'd ask him like, hey dad, tell me about that time. Like, it, just like this actually. And I've interviewed him on my podcast. It was really special for me to, mm. hear, to, to just talk about a lot of the same events, but he just expected us to go in. Part of it was to pay for college. Like, he was a government servant. We didn't make much money. Mm-hmm. ROTC was a great way to pay for college. So we just understood we were going to go do that. But it wasn't a hard sell for us. Um, and, and just speaking for myself, I was talking to my one of my older brothers about this a couple weeks back because I just interviewed him. And we just ex- expected to go in to the military. And it wasn't necessarily because we had a, a lineage of service per se. It was just how we grew up and an expectation and I, maybe it was part of, and I hate saying this, but the more guys I've interviewed over time, I've seen this this trend, like the books that you read and the movies you see mm-hmm. have a tremendous influence on mm-hmm. you. Like I have probably watched Top Gun as much as anyone on this planet. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I mean, I'd go right up there. And then I remember reading like the Dick Marchenko books about SEALs, reading about SEALs at Nam. Gulf War was big. Like they had playing cards for different aircraft. Like I thought the A-10 and the Apache were badass oh, yeah. <laughs> during that war, man. The Rock, you know, comes out. Like there, there were just some good movies and inspiration and the whole Cold War. Like we were very much a part of that. Uh, mm-hmm. My dad was in that Cold War world for much of his career. So we just grew up with that kind of like American centric focus. So I think it was more just this idea. We wanted to, we just wanted to serve and help the U.S., and we were just a little, I mean, we were very sports outdoor oriented. We had be outside playing, you know, um, army all day, all mm. night, shooting each other with whatever we could find. Like we just found a way to do it. So it's no surprise. I think the the thrill and the excitement took us there too. Absolutely. You know, and maybe it's not lineage, but you know, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a, uh, I'm not like a gene guy. I couldn't tell you. I'm not like a scientist. But what I do know is maybe it's not lineage, but when your old man is a guy that's outdoorsy and hunty and trappy and be out and be around and maybe he's a helicopter pilot, well, that's what's imprinting on you in your impressionable days. And that's what you want to be like. And especially if you had a good old man, which it sounds like you did. Yeah, and sure. I had a good father. So it's like when you when you see that, it's like that's what that's the idea of a man. That's the idea of a good man. And so maybe it's not in my genes, but maybe growing up, my positive role models in my life 
were good men doing these things. And so it drove and fostered, let's say, um, that life because I see it a lot in my son and he's young. He's only nine. Um, but he, he comes home with special forces books from the library. He talks about the Marine Corps all day long. He wants to go over when I go over, you know, I have a little, you know, a couple little group of guys that I served with around here, decorated war heroes, let's call them. And when we go over, he wants to look at their medals and he wants to read their stuff and he wants to look at my stuff and he wants to look at my butt, you know, so when you have that and you're inundated with that, I think there becomes this expectation. Well, that's just what we do here. That's, that's what I've always seen. And that's what I want to, you know, take part in. And it's beautiful because we haven't lost for a couple hundred years. So, um, yeah, I think we figured it out as a country, mm -hmm. as a country, for which, sure. which people should be fighting. <laughs> um, too cool. Okay. So we have history. We have brothers and siblings and fathers, um, it's just going to be the way talk to me about how you decide a uh, branch of service and then what you want to do as a specialty. Now I kind of get the, the helicopter thing. Um, but was that from the beginning? No. Yeah. Okay. That was not a certainty by any means. Um, and I should have said my dad's brother, my uncle is a, a retired Marine Colonel. So we also had that going on. Right on. He still has the haircut. Uh, like I love him <laughs> to death. It just never ends, you know? Like he used to sleep in his car on TDY to save the Marine Corps money for a hotel room. <laughs> it is just like through and through. I love it. It's anyway, a cult. Man. So he, it's a cult. He's great. He's great. Um, but no, there was no certainty that I would have gone aviation or even the army. So for me, I put in a packet for the Navy and the army um, for ROTC. Got both of them. Had to make a decision. And at that point I chose the army and to this day, you know, I still have regrets, but I would have regrets either way. And mm -hmm, to just mm -hmm. unpack that a little bit for people who um, have their own regrets or are making decisions like this and feel like, why isn't it easier? Like it was never an easy choice for me. Um, like I, I very much considered flying for the Navy or the SEAL route, I thought would be very interesting. Um, Something about the army with my dad and my brothers drew me to that. So that kind of won out for that first decision tree. And then I went through a, four years of ROTC. They paid for all my school. I did like jump school one summer, air assault another summer. And then this terrible course that they send you to for evaluations. And by the end of that, I had whatever pick I wanted for a branch. So like I, I worked very hard to give myself options, which mm -hmm. in the end, you regret one way that you chose or the other because you have all the options, but it's a good problem to have. Yeah, it's a good problem. So I still remember the night before I had to choose my branch because I was going to get whatever it is that I selected in the army, and it was between the infantry and aviation. And you know, I still don't know if I got it right. Um, I think there was just something about being able to connect with my, my old man um, with what he did. Sure. The stories I'd heard growing up um, that took me that direction. And for sure, it was 2000, you know, I had to put the, the packet in 2001, just before 9-11. So had I gone infantry, would I be here today? I don't know, like you nearly, you barely survived with what you did on the mm. ground. You know, certainly it would have been more dangerous in that route. So I still look back, like maybe that would have been a more interesting path, but, uh, and we'll get to this, but the, the worst day I had in Afghanistan in the aircraft was 40 years to the day that my dad had his worst day in Vietnam. No so, way. So like we've been able to connect on a very deep level because of this. So I would have regretted it had I not done that too. Sure. If that makes sense, you know. No, like, no, no, I I, I see what from. you're saying. I, I have um I have very similar uh which we talked about maybe before, but I have very similar thoughts throughout my career. Like I got offered or I got told to go to a um a um an indoc for recon but I had just got given my first squad as a corporal. So I was ahead of, you know, my billet. I had a squad and like all I ever wanted to do was lead a squad of regular infantry Marines against the enemy. And now you want to put me in rip. So I go to this end doc cause I didn't really have a choice. I get voluntold and I smoke checked it, you know, and then I turned it down. And so there's a, like in my brain, 
later, you know, after I get blown up and come back from Marja, I want to go over to Raider Battalion and get a seat to ANS. And that's what ultimately ends my career as far as operating was that, te- you know, so there's just weird things. And if I got yeah. over there, what would have happened? You know, who knows? So I could have got hurt and rip and ruined my career, you know, and never fought. For sure. So there's just a million different what ifs for sure when it when it pertains to career and combat but i i i don't i don't feel like i regret I, i'm always interested and curious but yeah. if i would have done something the different word. there's just no yeah. way to know what if it was better or not yeah regret might be too strong it, mm. it's you know i certainly think like what would it have been like had i gone that route what other yeah. opportunities would have opened which ones would have closed like yeah black yeah. hawk down had a huge impact on me i remember reading the book at jump school seeing the movie it's huge mm. and obviously aviation factors very heavily in that with the 160th so that probably also to some degree influenced my my call in the end for sure well, that's awesome. So I do want to know a little bit because I, like I said, offline, I, I love helicopters. Um, the first time I went up in a helicopter, I think was when I was in fast company and we were trying to do some, like, um, some fast roping. We had like a hearse master school going up. Right. And I always just pictured because it doesn't look like a helicopter should even fly to me. Um, I always pictured it just be like jostling around and to be this super uncomfortable ride. And, uh, once we were off the ground, I didn't feel anything. It was just smooth. And every helicopter I was ever on, there might have been some shutters, but for a machine that looks like it shouldn't even get off the ground to me, they were smooth. So I got questions as far as that's concerned. But first, I want to know, um, so once you pick that you're going to be aviation, then there's a bunch of different platforms. So is it like when you go to flight school, how you test? Because you said you set yourself up to get your pick earlier is that kind of how it goes the top percentage get to make a like a request or that's exactly how it goes okay you go through flight school for about a year and you've got 30 for me because i was a commissioned officer i had 30 other officers in my group and then there were warrant officers who had the same thing we go to the flight line together but obviously warrant officers are competing for warrant slots officers are competing for commissioned officer slots Mm -hmm. and at the end of those 12 months, your class rank, your OML, you know, kind of determines, they, they just put your names up on the board in rank order. And then they say for your class, the army has these aircraft. Mm-hmm. And they say, number one, you pick. And then you just go up and say, all right, I'm taking this aircraft. And I, again, like I just wanted to have the option. So I mm-hmm. worked hard to get the option. Um, so in our class, Apaches went one and two, and those were the only Apaches in a class of 30. But in other classes, like Chinooks will go first. It just whoever it just that depends. person is is yeah, they, what, what they, they want to do. Mm-hmm. I could see Kyle was being popular. Are they popular? Y- yes, but I will say, like we had a Kiowa in our class, but the guy who got it wanted an Apache. Like I, I would say, you would tend to want the Apache because it's got more lift, it's got more armament. I mean, Kiowa guys out there are going to hate me for saying that. I mean, everybody's (laughs) different. I get it. And my brother was a Kiowa pilot, so I would just say. You uh, want the Cadillac? would feed into 160th to be a gunner, to be, you know, like little bird age Mm -hmm. guy. I think think the little birds, I had a soft spot from a young age when I watched Black Hawk Down and I watched – I watched the brass kind of fall down on the guys on the ground as they came over. You know, and then uh, I want to say it was a couple of Kiowas that supported Dakota Meyer and his Medal of Honor uh, yeah. day uh, that came in and kind of helped him out and came right down to the ground, which is, you know, helping him out. So I always had a, like a affinity to them. But, yeah, I think if you wanted to uh, – the baddest ass uh, piece of gear out there, it's definitely probably Apache. So what, you were ranked number one or ranked number two? Yeah, I was one coming out of the class. Awesome. But it didn't start out that way, man. Like, I remember my first grade I got back early on in the class was like a C. (laughs) And and I was just thinking, like, there's no way. And GPA factors it into it, huh? It's huge, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, you get tested every week, every day on the flight line. You're getting graded. So it's just a year of grading. Do do peer evals come into that grading? Like, do you evaluate each other? Or is this strictly... Testing, flying yeah. from your instructor's evaluation. Yeah. Okay. There's no peer. Okay. Is there peer eval and what you went through in, in the Marine Corps? 
There is not in the schools that I went through, but during uh, ANS, you get peer evaled uh, by everybody yeah. at every stop because they have like a sleepover test, right? You could be the baddest ass machine out there, but if people don't like you, they won't bring you in. Yeah. Like exactly. if, if a group of people that are operators do not get along with you, you could smoke You're check gone. everything in the test and it doesn't matter. Yeah. And so I, and I think that's how they weed them out. Like who's selfish, uh, who's, who's the best team player. And so they fostered an environment, I think over there. And I, we get it from the army's Q, Q courses and, and, and Ranger stuff. So I know it's Ranger the school, army's, yeah. it's the army structure, uh, but it's right. Uh, at least on the ground side, because you don't want that. You don't want that guy that's going to outrun his logistics and his team and not communicate because he can. Uh, that's not yeah. the guy you want with you. So no. I think they do that part. Right. But okay. So you go through flight school and um, okay. Here's another thing I want to understand. So when you go through school, you've never flown. Do you even fly an Apache in school? You don't, you fly before you get to your first unit. So you go through the basic flight course and some advanced training, and then you pick your aircraft uh -huh. and then everybody goes and spends time in their aircraft. So like I flew an Apache in flight school in my advanced airframe training before I got to my Apache unit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But so the initial part of school, before you pick the airframe, you've never flown. No. Okay. What do you fly There's during school? There's always a handful of guys who have grown up flying for whatever reason. Civil Air Patrol, they had a dad who flew, whatever. Mm. I had nothing. I had never even seen an engine before. Like, I was so far behind the power curve, it was ridiculous. <laughs> um, so it was just a lot to catch up on. But yeah, so, some of these guys just had a love of flying from a l young age. So mm. they found their way to the cockpit. For us, you start out on, it's called a Bell Jet Ranger. So it, it's a civilian Kiowa. It looks exactly like a Kiowa. Just, it's like a news helicopter. So you start out on that, and then you once you you can handle the basic traffic patterns and stuff at an airfield, then you transition into an older model Kiowa. Okay. And you do what they call kind of like tactical flight training. So you do kind of masking behind trees, landing to confined areas, nap of the earth, um, navigation, that sort of thing. And that's that's where you stay for all of your initial training until you get your advanced airframe when you say nap of the earth can you explain that to me because i, th I yeah, think i have an idea I, I mean i know i have an idea of what that is but can you explain it yeah so and a lot of people will call it map of the earth incorrectly so it's nap like n-a-p i actually and thought it was you're... nape so that's that's yeah, how far yeah. off there I you am. go so it's not even nape right <laughs> so it's map of the earth where you're flying you got the skids or the wheels just a couple feet above the treetops mm -hmm. and you're flying um fast and low as opposed to like at 1500 feet you come down real low whether it's like radar signature or just to avoid somebody on the ground getting a, a look at you for too long um it was all moves pioneered in vietnam for the most part Mm -hmm. that we still use and it's very hard to do it's hard to navigate when you're low level like that you don't have the you know like the same bird's eye view yep. to see intersections and terrain features and it's dangerous like if you don't negotiate a tree at the right altitude or a power line especially in the u.s something like that it that's what kills people mm -hmm. so that's it's fun it's exciting but it's nerve-wracking mm -hmm. now because I'm so ignorant as far as the airframe is concerned, do you, can you just give me a basic down and dirty? What are you doing with your hands and feet to keep altitude and roll and, and steer this thing? Yeah. So one of the things that I mentioned to people when we talk about flying is how, how hard it is to hover, to learn how to hover. Okay. So everybody's a damn type A coming into flight school and like, oh, I'm going to nail this, knock it out of the park. And everybody gets their ego destroyed. Ego it, smasher. It, it takes at least six hours, six consecutive hours on the flight controls <coughs> until you can hover. And once you learn how to hover, you're good for the rest of your life. But those six hours are dangerous as hell. So <laughs> the reason I say that is I you're learning it. how how the different flight controls all work together. So you've got a cyclic, which is kind of like the joystick. You got a, and that gives you kind of the directional left, right, forward, back. Okay. And you've got a collective, which is this like long arm on your left side. And that gives you power. So like go up and down. Mm -hmm. And then you've got pedals, 
which changed the pitch of the tail rotor blade. And that's what, yeah, lets you yaw left and right. Okay. But the, the trick here is if I make like one input to the left, like a slight input to the left on my cyclic, it changes the pitch of the main rotor blade and then causes us to, to move to the left and decrease, like my nose will go down mm -hmm. and so we'll descend. So I have to pull in collective while I do that a very certain amount if I want to maintain position. And as I pull in collective, we come up a little bit, but it forces the aircraft to turn like yaw. Mm -hmm. So you have to counter that with the pedals. And when you counter that with the pedals, then you're back to the cyclic. So you have these, this like three area dance movement with the controls that you have to master effectively to hover in one place, to just be stationary in one place. And so what happens is mm. they take you out to the aircraft with your instructor pilot. You have controls on both sides of the aircraft. He takes off, gets to a five foot hover, and it feels like what you said, stable, feels great, <laughs> no jerking around. And he's like, you have the controls. Okay, I have the controls. You hop on the controls and everything's cool for like two seconds. And then it slowly starts getting out of hand. And then it looks like, like you're riding a bull at a rodeo, man. It's like all over the place. And the oh. IP takes the controls, sets down. And that's like 10 seconds has elapsed. And you do that for six hours over several days. And mentally you're smoked. Like, I'm sure. The amount of attention required to do that is, is pretty significant. So and you say once you get it, it's, what is it kind of like riding a bike? Like once you it's get exactly the feel like the for exactly how it is, then you just know how to move your body and can in conjunction with other other limbs, yeah. and then that's you right. just begin to feel it. You become okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's um, I've never flown anything, but I see the foot pedals in the movies and the and I'm like, what are they doing? I, I don't know what they're yeah. doing in there. Uh, but they're doing it right. So that shows you how probably insanely hard a maneuver, like let's say a Black Hawk down style maneuver, uh, when you've got rockets coming in to throw that. Yeah. You know, that's insane, huh? Yeah, that yaw, knowing what's coming, kicking the yaw out and like yeah, adjusting the aircraft for that with a guy on the fast rope, I can't even imagine. Yeah, that's insane. I seen some in in the in the first couple of days of our invasion. I seen some helicopter pilots do things that, and I don't know if they did it on purpose. They made it look really really sexy, uh, but they did things that I didn't want to be in that aircraft. Matter no, of fact, I my first you, guy that got shot, my first guy that got shot, didn't want to get back on the bird because of what it looked like coming in to get him. <laughs> Uh, he's like, I'll take my chances on my feet, but yeah, I, that's, I, I wanted, I wanted to say just one thing. Cause earlier I hate saying like, yeah, I was number one in the class. It makes me sound like an asshole. And the, and the reason I say that is like, I loved all these guys that were in the class with me. And one of the, the very few aircraft, like you don't really get it is medevac. Mm -hmm. That mission set is insane to me. Oh, no, yeah. no real armament. You're going into basically whenever the worst of the worst LZ, you got to go to the ground wherever you guys are and you're picking up guys who have to get back right now or they're going to die mm -hmm. so i just those I guys are insane yeah for the other pilots in the community and i just don't want people to be like oh look at this jerk no i mean i don't think you class. said it Not that's a that's a big issue with our community is that we self-denigrate people can do amazing things and you don't want to talk about it and you don't want to pretend like you have skill and you say, Oh, that's just what everybody yeah. do. And most of the time it's complete bullshit. It's, it's self denigration. So being number one in the, any military school, especially a flight school is, is doing something, but there's good pilots across every platform. I'll echo that. Sure. I watch sure. guys come in for uh, dust off the dust off crews coming in to pick, like you sure saying coming in to pick us up and they're when they get on the ground they're cool calm and collected like nothing's going on and yeah. uh and i wouldn't be like that <laughs> i'm running up to them usually with somebody hurt bad like go oh, get you know what are you doing why are you smiling at me um but they love it man so that's awesome big shout out to uh to all the platforms that's yeah in no way did uh in my opinion did that come off that way but nah, we sure. do self-denigrate as a as a culture of people. Um, okay. So let's move forward. So you get into the, um, okay, here's my next question. And I'm, I know this is a little bit aviation nerd questions that maybe everybody doesn't love, but I got questions. When you first fly the, when you first fly the Apache, what's that like? 
So that like control and all, everything. The controls are better because of, I mean, so I will say, if you do have somebody who's an aviation nerd, I recently interviewed another Apache guy named Brian Slade, and we talk in depth about a lot of this. So mm -hmm. if anybody wants to go deeper, you can like- Oh, I'm definitely going to. I don't blame you because it's, I nerd out on it when I talk to aviators, mm -hmm. but specifically he's another Apache driver. So we talked a lot about this. The Apache, so the control movements are faster because it's got electronic hydro. Basically, when you make a, a control input, instead of the the linkages, like the truly the controls connecting to the rotor, mm -hmm. like a signal is sent instead, like so electronic it's instantaneous, signal. Yeah. So it's faster. So it, it's got stability there. It even has like an automatic hover button. We rarely used it, but it had it. But the difference, the thing that's hard about the Apache, and it takes longer to learn to fly the Apache because it's got this, I don't know if you've, you've seen, the, it's got like a glass monocle that you wear in your right eye. Mm -hmm. And all of your weapons and flight symbology is displayed on that. And the other aircrafts don't have this. And they have it so that you can use the FLIR, which is your infrared system on the front, for targeting. Mm -hmm. So you have to learn how to fly with only one eye is the key. So you fly this thing, they call it the bag, and everybody pukes when they learn to do this in the Apache. So they cover the cockpit with the, like literally they line it so you can't see outside. And you have to fly with only one eye. And I don't, I don't know how that's, like now I know how hard it is, but when you fly normally, mm -hmm. you need binocular vision. So you can like depth perception, it, imagine driving with one eye, you know, like how do you know when you're slowing down and now yeah, you yeah. have a third dimension of altitude. So learning to fly with one eye where the other eye is looking at the cockpit and lights and things in the cockpit and the other is staring at a glass symbol like this is super, super difficult to get your head around. Mm -hmm. So it takes several hours to learn how to do that. So that overcoming that sensation of like flying with one eye is tough. Everybody gets it. It's not like people quit because of it. It just takes a while. Can you see to through? Learn. Is it like a heads yeah. up display? It is, it's a heads okay. up display. So you look through it, but on it, you've got the symbology. So and you need to know how to cycle through that. And yeah. do, do you so cycle through it? Like, is you, are you able to select weapons through it on yeah, your screen? Yeah, I mean, or? Yeah, you'll you'll select weapons with your hands and it'll change what it shows on the screen. But yeah. it'll show you like your flight path. So so you don't need to be able to see outside. And if there's no moon, for instance, like you can't use NVGs, which happened a lot, only aircraft with FLIR could go out. Mm -hmm. So cause you could fly with infrared. So you're just using the change in temperature of objects to yep. determine uh, what's out there. So you you would see that image, the FLIR image on your reticle with your flight path vector on top of it. So it would have like your altitude and all that. And everything else is just black because it's blackout. Correct. Or you might have some instrument lights on the inside, but not a whole That's lot, right. I assume. Yeah. So your other eye, your free eye, is kind of drawn to those other lights that are only two feet in front of you. And the other one is like on this thing right, right in front of your eye, but also looking out into the horizon. Yeah, yeah. So it's disconcert, it's kind of, uh, it's uncomfortable for a while. Mm-hmm. But it's super fun to fly. Like the first time you go to gunnery is awesome. You're firing 30 mil rockets, all kinds of stuff. It's awesome. Yeah, I bet it is. <laughs> yeah, I've seen some of the cockpit uh, photo or videos from like ranges, but I've also seen them, some of them from, you know, in country. And it looks like uh, it looks exactly like the video games. It looks like it would be yeah. a, a really good time to me um, if I could understand how to steer like i can't even play the drums with my hands in my feet do you know what i mean so it's like oh, i go. don't know if i could i don't know if i don't know if i could do that right like physically you can you can i don't know everyone can they don't weed people out of that that's the one thing with flight school it's not like people get cut like it's buds not at all everybody can fly okay well i don't th i think it, i definitely I, I i struggled to do different things with my <laughs> you know like the i struggle with that so if I had to do a bunch of things and people's lives are on the line, I pass. I'm staying on the ground. I'm staying on the ground, but I do respect it. That's a fact. So talk to me about you get through, you get your training and checking into your first unit as a pilot, as a commissioned officer in the army. Um, that's got to be fun because that's a long time. Uh, I think a lot of people 
have this idea that you enlist kind of like I did. I enlist, I went to a couple of schools and then boom, I'm in a unit that year, let's say. And for you guys, your path is just so much longer that I would imagine the anticipation of checking into a unit after a couple years learning what you're going to be doing there is probably awesome. It's probably way better than, you know, checking in, let's say after SOI or something for me. It is. Yeah. No, I mean, it was probably 15 months total from the time I got out of, you know, got into flight school till I was at the unit mm. that I got to eventually. And I went to Germany to a unit that had just redeployed from Iraq. Not unlike every other guy I've talked to, including yourself, it doesn't matter what rank you are. And when you come in, you are still lower than dog crap <laughs> on the totem pole. Um, so within the commission ranks, you get the worst job. You're doing all the additional duties. You don't know how to fly for real. The IPs are like, hey, <laughs> I know they taught you all this stuff. You don't know anything. Just shut Forget up and everything. <laughs> Forget everything they taught you at the schoolhouse. Um, so you still have that. But yeah, yeah. Like there, I, I would imagine you and a lot of these other guys would agree, Ryan, like there's no place else you'd rather be than no, no, for sure. at that unit. For sure. Yeah, you got to learn. You got to grow. And uh, I mean, we talked about it when I recorded on yours. I had one of those growing kind of careers that end up culminating in an awesome spot, but I had to grow and go yeah. do some of these things and go through some of the, you know, all the things before I actually got there, which helped me out it sounds like it helped you out as well for sure so what does an additional duty for a commission pilot look like is this like staff duty type stuff or so if you're lucky i was lucky i got sent right to a platoon as mm -hmm. soon as i got there um so i was a platoon leader right out of the gates which is what every early commissioned officer prays for mm -hmm. um the worst thing that could happen is you become an assistant s3 so you're in the ops shop, you're one of many captains and you're, or lieutenants waiting for a platoon to open. And maybe mm -hmm. it takes a, a couple of years. Um, some of the, I mean, you're still helping out with. How much is a platoon? J just so platoon I understand. Platoon in aviation, at least on the Apache side, it was, it's small. I mean, it's four aircraft and 20 people. Okay. So that's okay. Eight pilots. So eight commission, uh, eight warrants, yeah, maybe 10 warrants. And. 10 maintainers like aircraft maintainers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so and then companies two of those maybe three platoons like that check check and you do you fly on a daily basis when you get out there or even a weekly basis or yeah if you're in a platoon you're flying regularly a couple times a week in and this is conventional like if you're on 160th you're probably flying every day conventional if you're in a platoon or company you're flying a couple times a week but if you're a staff officer, like an assistant S3, assistant S4, S1, you might fly once every two weeks. Mm -hmm. So nobody wants to fly with you because you're rusty all the time. So you you have to earn your stripes with the guys. You got to go like spend time in the simulator. If you're not getting aircraft time, you got to go put in time in the simulator, which is not as much fun. But you people got to see you're working for it. And when sure. you show up. You got to be ready to go as a staff officer. So as a platoon leader, though, you're flying more regularly. You're you're planning missions. So, like you might do a, a training mission where you want to hit a certain phase line at a certain time at a certain altitude, or practice gun runs or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you're organizing those. You're doing mission briefs. You're working on maintenance. N Apache's notoriously break down. So uh, you got to make sure your aircraft are ready to go. You're yeah. constantly worried about maintenance. Now. Our which is not is that fun, something that but... the pilot is doing though? Is that something that the pilot has to worry about? Or is it like you have to make sure that your maintainers are doing their job kind of thing? Yeah. You got to make sure the maintainers are doing their job, but to be honest and you know, my, especially if my first sergeant from back in the day listens to this commissioned officers don't know anything that they're doing about maintaining aircraft. <laughs> the first sergeant does. Yeah. So basically as a, as an officer, you need to know what's going on with the aircraft, like what part is missing, where is it at in the supply chain, how long until this aircraft gets up, which one gets rotated in. You have to know all that for when the battalion commander asks you about it. But nobody is is fooled. It's the soldiers who know what's actually going on and have to fix that thing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that's just how it is. And You're I getting like a brief on that case. information, I assume? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> I got you. I got a couple of buddies that are maintainers for where well, they were for the V22. I think they're done now, but um, yeah. yeah. And so there's always something going on there. Um, yeah. Seemingly. So talk to me about your first pump. Um, downrange. So I was so worried and I was in flight school, like just after nine 11, um, 2002 into 2003. And I just felt like I was going to miss this war. The unit I got to in Germany had just come back from Iraq and really got, they were supposed to be this, the first use of the Apache in Iraq, like battalion level missions. And they really got beat up. Uh, oh, publicly. really? Yeah, so they had a, a significant op that happened on March 23rd of 2003, where they ended up doing kind of like Cold War tactics almost, flying out, stationary hover, lots of aircraft, shooting at targets at once, and they ended up setting up right above the enemy. They were getting lit up. A couple aircraft browned out on takeoff. They just weren't used to doing that. What's that so mean? It was, a brownout is when you're taking off or landing in a dust cloud because of the sand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's it's hard to fly like that because you lose vi visual with the ground, with other aircraft. So it's there's a tendency to roll over in the aircraft and like crash, mm -hmm. which happened. Um, so that event was pretty bad. Is that, that what year. browning out means? You crashed? Or it just means no, that... because it can be brownout conditions. <clears throat> but in this case... They had brownout conditions and crashed as a result of it, mm -hmm. which sucks. It's really bad. I mean, it's it's dangerous, um, just inherently dangerous. Was it a dust storm? Yeah. I, I mean, it's not a dust storm. It's just because you're taken off where there's a lot of sand. And okay. It just okay. creates like a <clears throat> just a vortex of, of sand. You can't see anything. Yeah. No. I, dude, I've, I've operated on foot in Iraq where the where the dust storms look like the movie yes. the mummy i didn't know that shit was real until i went to the middle east i thought it was like cgi for entertainment <laughs> but it looks like a wall of just like the movies and it when it gets it's there there's man. zero visibility a lot of times they would they would call it red air for us and red air meant that no support agencies could fly in the in the weather um and, and so we would have to kind of halt ground operations. This was early Iraq, or not early, maybe 06, 07 time frame. Yeah. But when the air would go red, it was like hold in place or, or take a compound because we yep. can't get a medevac to you if your mission goes bad. Yep. And so um, I assume this, that's why, because of those conditions, oh, your yeah. you oxygen for the helicopter and, and everything it's else. It's the wind, it's visibility. It's all dangerous. So, and when I say brownout, I'm not talking about those, but I I know those. I've been in those, mm -hmm. not in an aircraft, but in Kuwait. Like I sat through one of those, and it, and it's surreal. Yeah, it's this insane. is just more, and this happens with snow also. So we would practice this in Germany, like land into snow environments where the snow just like really powdery snow gets kicked up. Yeah, and you can't see anything for a minute. So it's like a whiteout. You have to land faster to do it to get in before you get inside the cloud, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Gosh, anyway, I never thought about that. I never thought about yeah because you guys are in the sand all the time when you come in uh, over there. Right. So that's why, if you probably recall, when you're over there, like they started creating concrete pads, even yeah. small pads that you could land to to avoid this, and then they they would water the dirt so it was heavier and couldn't get kicked up yeah, to avoid all yeah. that. Yeah, that moon dust is something else over there. Uh, just that oh, fine yeah. like baby powder and and i can imagine that plays hell on y'all it's so bad for the aircraft yeah it gets sucked into it too right oh yeah for yeah, sure yeah, it just yeah. corrodes things yeah mm. um but the reason i say this is i had just gotten to this unit they just came back from iraq they had this black eye basically um from that so they didn't go back out again for the, my two to three years at that unit oh wow so so i sat out for that i went to between platoon and um, company command, you go to a course. So typically I would go to Fort Rucker, which is where the aviation school is. But I, I competed to get into this, into the infantry course, because I wanted to work with guys who are going to be infantry company commanders. Sure. Like I just wanted to sit next to them and listen. Like, how do you think through problems? How do you take a building? How do you take a town? How do you give mission briefs? Like, that's who I knew I would be working with as an Apache. Mm -hmm. So I went to... Benning for that for seven months 
went through that course and then I went to the 101st and we deployed right away to Afghanistan. So well, sorry for the what's lead that up there, course, but it was just- What's that course called though? So the every branch has the captain's career course. That's what we call it. And this one is called the maneuver captain's career course because it has infantry, artillery, and armor in one. Gotcha. Is that an ass kicker? No. No? No. No. Very gentleman. But you're gentleman learning course. a lot. You're learning a ton. Yeah. Uh, you got 100 guys in the class. Um, you're, you're going through like the basics of company infantry operations, like how you lead a company in different scenarios. That's great, though, because um, it gives you essay yes. on the lingo, how they're talking, Dude, what they're huge. like when you can think inside of their brain, you can help them from up up top i imagine a whole lot better yeah, yeah. so I, I could anticipate like i wasn't an infantry commander but i could anticipate like decisions they'd have to make and what how they could best utilize me i really understood that and there were probably three units i worked with in afghanistan who the, the commander on the ground was my classmate so oh wow like i'd call him up and he'd be like hey ryan is that you yeah it's me like who's who is that and we'd talk and like you know we have that shared experience so that was really helpful for me to understand how you guys lived, but it yeah, wasn't a cool. tough course. Now I will say the guys who graduated one, two, and three were all Marines, which I thought was hilarious Sweet. in this army course because <laughs> they do not send their weak links, man. They sent some heavy hitters and they were all good dudes. No, nah, man. Well, if you go to a school like that and you don't do well at it, your career's over in the Marine oh, yeah. Corps. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you they could do, do well or second. you could just, or you could just get out go do well. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Um, okay. So, so you come out of that, you go to the 101st and then boom, you're right out the door to Afghanistan this time. Yeah. So okay. I moved into one of these assistant S3 positions. I was more senior than coming out of initial training. Mm -hmm. And, and then I switched out of command. I switched into a, a company command in Afghanistan with a guy who is a legend in the aviation community. So, um, not that this is super important, but it might be interesting to some people here. So the guy I, I took command from was a guy named Clint Cody. Um, he is now a full colonel. In all likelihood, will be a general. He's commanded in the 160th. He's commanding the 101st Aviation Brigade, which is probably the most important conventional aviation brigade that we have. Um, but his dad was the highest ranking aviator in Army history. So his dad was the vice chief of staff um, post 9-11, uh, helped create 160th, fired the first shots in the Gulf War from an Apache, like a legend wow. in the community. So his dad came out for our change of command ceremony in Afghanistan. So it was a very important moment for him to see his son like give up command. Um, and then I stepped into a unit that was in really, really great shape Yeah. Um, at the time. Like he, he's phenomenal as a leader. So I, I could not have asked for a better situation. Um, but I took, I took over earlier on in the year. Um, and as you know, like the fighting doesn't happen as much in the, the deep winter time, but like from spring to late fall is when the fighting season happens. So mm -hmm. we were, we were heavily, um, involved in operate delivered operations, uh, recon and security all kinds of work ticks like responding to troops in contact frequently um, for for the majority of our time there and we were based out of Salerno in coast but we were the only attack aviation that could get to our throughout much of RC East like seven provinces wow um, we had Kiowas but they couldn't get outside of coast because they didn't have the power capability hmm. so we were like the only show in town we'd have like hour and a half long flights to just get to a troops in contact which is rough. What's that leave you with as far as fuel? What's a, what's a full tank give you as far as hours wise? So we had um, some external fuel tanks on so we could get like two and a half hours worth of flight time. Um, and then we'd have to get refuel, which could take 15, 20 minutes, maybe. Just refueling in the again. air uh, up at no. a holding position or you got to go back nope. and sit down. We got to go to the ground. No, there were forward deployed refueling oh, all okay. over the place. Um, so we could do that, but it was still like, there's a troops in contact an hour and away, an hour away. There's no chance we're going to get there in time to support those guys. No. Yeah. So that was pretty tough. Yeah. That would have to be a long tick. Yeah. Now what's your op tempo? Is it every day? Are you flying every day? 
Yeah, so we'd always have at least two. First of all, we only went out with two aircraft. You would never go out single ship. Yeah. Um, and we'd always have two aircraft prepped as QRF, just as a quick reaction um, to go anywhere within our battle space. Mm -hmm. And then typically we would have at least one other flight going out for at least one bag of gas, as we call it, like two and a half hours, um, just doing some recon for the intel shop. If there was a ground unit that just wanted us to go check something out behind a ridge line, um, take a look at a route, whatever, we would go do it for them. Mm -hmm. And we just check in with different units as we were flying around, like, hey, do you need us to do anything for you? Um, and then we would have, we call them deliberate operations. So we did a ton of work with like third special forces group was mm -hmm. with us there. Mm -hmm. um, and just a lot of conventional units where we were a task force. So we had Chinooks, we had Blackhawks. Um, so we would do air escort for some of these guys going in on a deliberate op. We'd provide support over the operation while they're doing a hit on a target. Um, and then we'd cover their, their exfil. So we'd be a part of all of that. And we do those fairly regularly, probably weekly, if not more often than that. Oh, yeah. And are you pulling the trigger on any of these? Yeah. Or we, a lot of these? Yeah. Um, our guys were pulling the trigger a lot. For me, mainly on your deliberate I, hits, I assume. Yeah. On the deliberates, yeah. Occasionally we'd pull the trigger. Occasionally for troops in contact, we would the QRF. Um, it's not every time, you know, sometimes there'll be a, as you know, from doing a hit on a house, like if you got the element of surprise, yeah, you don't, that thing goes to plan. There's no shooting. It's just yeah. in and out and we're gone. Now, what's but, that? Yeah. What's that? Can you, are you watching this whole thing on a FLIR though from the sky? Yeah. So you can yeah, see so friendly forces moving into position, moving into cordon, and then making a hit. Yeah, that's yeah. got to so be So we cool. would be the first aircraft to get visual with the target, and we'd have the Blackhawks and Chinooks bringing in the assaulters behind us. So mm -hmm. we'd just be looking for any sentries, any potential obstacles that might be new from the mission brief, um, verifying the LZs, where they're going to put the guys down. Like, yep. <laughs> is there all of a sudden a car parked there or whatever? Yeah, or is it like a um, so flooded kind of a flooded that. field or, once, or whatnot? Yeah, once they get on the ground, though, we'll, we'll move up to probably like 1,000 or 1,500 feet, and we're almost like a drone. We're kind of circling, watching what's going on, mm -hmm. getting ready to take a shot if necessary, and we're looking for any squirters, any, you know, like any bad guys running off the objective, any reinforcements coming on the objective, any maneuvering around in the objective on the friendlies, which happens occasionally. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. and then we're deconflicting you know you'll usually have some other fixed wing aircraft in the stack above you you, know, yep. you could have an ac-130 which is the greatest aircraft ever yeah you could have that's the hammer time yeah they're so good they're so good never got to use one i've had them had them in support oh. but i never got to see them unleash the fury but they're great <laughs> i assume you have <laughs> oh man they did this one thing, man, where I'm going to pop a beer here. So if you hear it, that's what's going on. Okay. Um, okay. We had one where we couldn't see that they were trying to talk us onto a target and we just could not get eyes on it. Uh -huh. And they were like, all right, we're going to put the God beam on. And we're like, what's the God beam? It, but we don't say that to them. Yeah. As a pilot, you would never say that. We would say, Roger that. Standing and then by. Internal comms, <laughs> we would be like, hey, dude, what's the, what's the God beam? And then they put down this like spotlight that was just over um, like, you know, it wasn't, it, you could not see it with the naked eye, but just, we could see it over so IR. Um, NVGs. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, it felt like a football field size rectangle on the ground that, that just lit up this mm. part of the ground. And we knew exactly what they were talking about, but it looked like God had said, this building is where I'm looking. <laughs> The really God cool. beam. It's interesting yeah. how many uh, religious connotations we put on our weapon systems, isn't it, as Americans? For sure. Have you ever thought about yeah. that? Like no, yeah. hellfire and brimstone yeah. <laughs> and God beam and things of this nature. Yeah. Rods That's from true. God, the kinetic energy weapon in space. It's just weird to me how, how not only are we going to kill you, but we're going to kill you on behalf of the God that you hate in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> um, inshallah. Yeah, that's crazy, man. I didn't even know that that existed, but hey, I'm, that's great. But we'd work with them. Like we had a pretty interesting engagement with them. I don't know if you want to get into this, right? Yeah, absolutely, not. absolutely. Um, we had 
an assault element on the ground. I think it was third special forces group was moving on a target and we spotted some, some insurgents kind of maneuvering on them around a courtyard mm. kind of on the outside of, of a building. And we were trying to get lined up to take a shot and the AC 130 had kind of primacy in that part of the, the objective. We could see them AC 130 couldn't, we got them onto the target and these guys were in a building and this AC 130 just started dropping their, what's it? One Oh fives to come out of that. Oh thing. yeah. Like how it's around just walking it onto the target. They probably only needed two shots and then they, because it was the the insurgents had kind of holed up in this part, this um, kind of small shed that was mm -hmm. attached to the main house. So they had to be really deliberate in hitting this mm -hmm. at the right angle. So they kind of landed their first round maybe twenty meters outside of the building area, then ten meters, and then they just demolished this shed. Bingo. Um, and those guys stayed inside the whole time and just got crushed because of it. But they were maneuvering. Like we could see them moving with their weapons yeah. to try to get position on, on our guys on the ground. And the, the ground commander's like, you guys are cleared. Just take the shot. So we did. Well, well yeah. in this case, the AC-130 did, but we worked with them for that shot. Yeah, that's wild. That's wild. You get, is that footage classified? Are those videos classified? I see a lot of stuff on YouTube a lot, and I never know how they can release that. I, I got to say, man, I don't know either because it seems like it should be sensitive. classified to me. Yeah. What I, I end up seeing a lot of it, just like you do. Um, you know, it doesn't have a classification on it necessarily, but there are grids and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. like we'll, like, I've used one, the guy, Brian Slade that I know that I was just telling you about, who was an Apache guy. He had gun footage from one of his engagements where the front seater got shot through the leg oh, um, and, and was bleeding out. So ah, I watched to, that one. I didn't know who you were talking about. I watched your episode with him. Yeah. So he had to fly that thing back real quick. And so we had the gun footage from that to kind of show, no kidding, this is what it's like in the aircraft when one of the pilots is actually shot. Yeah. This is the chaos on the radios. It's a good, I don't know, it's kind of a good microcosm of what it feels like. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Maybe they're, I don't know if they're classified or not. I know that when, when I was an instructor at the school of infantry, I showed a video one time that got me in trouble. The reason it got me in trouble was because there was, um, enemy combatants, uh, faces in it. Now, like, okay. Tracking, but it wasn't like whole faces. If that, if you know what yeah. I'm saying, yeah. And they, and they like, they were very, very serious about not showing faces. And I didn't know, like, I didn't know that we got all kinds of videos with, with things on them. And I was just trying to get these young war fighters being right mindset. Like, Hey, this is your job. And they hammered, yeah. not, I didn't get in trouble in trouble, but uh, you know, BC come down and say, Hey, hey zero. Um, we can't show things like this. And it's like, okay. That's crazy to me at the schoolhouse. No less like that. Well, just doesn't sound right. well, here's here. Okay. Let me, let me, let me unfold it one more layer. Um, there was a Marine in that class. This is infantry training battalion. And I am showing a video on the takedown of Fallujah during Phantom Fury, essentially an unfiltered video. One of my students last name was Hussein. And I'll let you take from that as you want. But when he comes from over there and we're showing a moto video with rock and roll in the background and people throwing up, you know, cow horns to killing a bunch of potential relatives of his or bloodlines of his, he got really upset. But it's like, you're a Marine and that's where I'm sending you. Um, regardless, we got kind of on a rabbit hole there, but I don't know why. I, I just wonder sometimes what's... Um, what's classified and what's not classified. And I think that we have video games and simulators that look so real that I don't know if you could prove that it wasn't a simulator, you know? So yeah. certain missions, pretty wild. I always enjoy them though from, from the YouTube. So if they're simulators, keep bringing them. I like them. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Um, so you, you said, um, okay. I, I lost my train of thought, but you did say that, you had a really bad day in Afghanistan. Were you referring to March 23rd of 03 or is that? 
no, no. So March 23rd, what, 03 was Iraq in this unit. Oh, that's I what I meant. To, so I was not part of it. This was 2008. We just okay, we had a okay. deliberate operation in, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Wardak province. Yeah. So it's near, near Kabul. Anytime we went there, there was a fight. There wasn't like a very well-established base or cop at the time. And the infantry battalion commander was good friends with my aviation battalion commander. They both went to West Point together. Mm -hmm. And this guy wanted to go in and just pick a fight in this valley. So we infilled his, one of his companies, an, an army infantry conventional company. We infilled him, left him for probably 10 days, and then had to exfil him. And we tried to convince our battalion commander not to do this. We're like, somebody's going to get killed doing this. It just doesn't make sense. But we were committed, so we supported it. Mm -hmm. When we infilled him, nothing happened. It was the exfil was a 10-hour gunfight, like a literal gunfight for 10 hours in our aircraft. Like that's the longest we can fly with a general officer approval. Um, we're not supposed to fly past like eight hours in the day or four hours at night. It's just crazy. So that um, means you have to go down for fuel several times. Yeah, multiple times and for ammunition. Like we'd, we'd go Winchester where we're out of, uh, we're out of ammo and mm -hmm. had to go mm -hmm. refuel and rearm. Um, but it, like as we were flying in for this, we were escorting Chinooks in and we were getting airburst RPGs shot up at between the aircraft. Um, we were able to air exfil people, no problem, but half of the unit had to exfil on the ground through your very like stereotypical Afghan Valley, huge mountain, like thousand foot mountains on both sides, one road in the middle. Like it's mm -hmm. a, an ambush dream. Like Panjir. Or... And so they just, hard to see them. Yeah. Um, they set up on these guys as they were exfilling and took a shot at one of the gunners, a direct RPG to one of the, to one of the um, Humvees and all hell broke loose and we were just in a fight for hours that day and like right as it was kicking off we could not from the air there were two apaches up there we could not see the bad guys they just had such good concealment were they dug the in no no they just were there was just enough foliage in the kind of the valley floor was green you know it had yeah. like, you know what it's like there better than anyone you know, it's not what people, a lot of people would imagine like, oh, it's Afghanistan, it's barren. No, I mm -hmm, mean, like, mm -hmm. there's buildings and and greenery there. So they, they just knew exactly where to set up. So we couldn't see anything. We couldn't see these guys. It's chaos on the radio. Like people are screaming on the radio. Mm. And Ground elements and or air we, elements? Ground, ground. Mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. like needed to get a medevac. They're taking fire from every direction have to find a place where we can get a medevac in and they're just you know there are a few times from the air like these are the t this is why i wanted to be a gun pilot like to be in those moments like i just wanted to be there for guys like you on mm. the ground when you needed it and, and so to not be able to pull the trigger is the most frustrating thing yep. humanly possible because the idea if you're on the ground i think is hey they're in the air they have like all these magical optics. They should see everything. And there are just times where you can't find it. Yeah. Um, but there were a few times, and this was one of them, where you're talking to guys on the ground who are screaming because it's like their life is on the line. And it's not always like that. They've got standoff or they've got, they're in control of what's going on in the ground. But there are the few times where that wasn't the case. You just notice the difference in someone's voice. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's troubling, man. Like it's very frustrating to not be able to help. So uh, in my opinion, I had our, our, the three best other pilots in our unit were in the air with me that day. And we just had a quick discussion over the radios and the most senior guy said, Hey, nobody has to do this, but I think we need to go and draw fire away from them until they can break contact. Like we're not going to be able to take a shot. We can't see these guys and they're just getting crushed right now. So he's like, anybody disagree? And all of us were like, let's go do it. So we flew in low overhead several times and we like, we came back with multiple rounds in our aircraft, in our fuel cell, in like just throughout the fuselage. And at one point we watched an RPG fly like right by our air, 
probably every time I tell this, it gets closer, but it, <laughs> like we joked about it afterwards, the, this guy, Sean, who I love to this day, um, he was our backseater. He was on the controls. I was on the guns and this, this RPG just flies out our window and he and I joked about it later once we got on the ground and everything was fine. Like it felt like an Acme rocket. Like we were watching from like Wiley Coyote or something. It just like we could see the back of it, the the cone flying forward. Like the thing air bursts were done, and it just kept sailing. And we broke to the right. It kept going straight. Um, mm. But I just feel like from that point on, I was a different person. Like it, I, I asked this to a lot of guys, Ryan. I'd be curious. I don't know if you and I talked about it, but. I try to ask people if there was ever a time where they just realized in that line of work, like I might die and I got to be okay with it. And I feel like to me, that was that moment for me. Sure. Yeah. I think two things can come of that. It can be catastrophic or it can be, um, extremely positive in my case. Yeah. I, and I think we talked about it when I recorded on your show, but I, I re I made that very early like day one day two of us actually invading it yeah, was like i remember you saying this not sure if we're coming out of that but what it did for me was it allowed me to to fight the way i needed to fight to exactly. not be cautious and go out put the tactics down i know that it works go out and, and fight and when you're able to do that because you've already accepted the fact that your line of work could take you to a certain place man, you can become very, very dangerous. Just like I'm sure you guys felt when it's like, I know we need to go draw fire away from these guys. I know we do need to do that. But unless, yep. you, unless you've unless you understood fully what that meant prior to that, there could be some reservation. There could be some hiccups. To On that day, obviously, you had four of the best pilots in the, you know, in the unit in the air, and everybody had already thought about that. And yeah. said, yeah, we need to go help them, and damn if we go down. I, I think you're right. Like it just unlocks, it just allows you to be more dangerous, honestly, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and risky, mm -hmm. um, which is good for that. And then, and I think honestly, when it comes to the religion piece, which we talked about earlier, it was like this day, yeah, it was just a different person. That's where that I was going to next was, yeah. is this the day that faith is lost over there? Yeah. And, and I, I, I feel like it was probably eroding over time. Um, I had a pretty significant event that happened when I was in my unit in Germany, like right when I got out of flight school, my first unit that we were talking about before, just before I left there to go to Benning to that other course, we did a gunnery exercise. And then this was 2005, maybe six. So we're just now getting like, this is how you should fight from an Apache in Iraq and Afghanistan. You should not go and stationary hover. You can't, you don't have enough power. It's too hot or too high. You need to shoot on the move. When you shoot on the move, you have to use these techniques. So we're learning and then executing new flight techniques for the first time. And we did it during a gunnery exercise out of Grafenbeer. And I was a, this is not that important, but I was a pilot in command, which means I was responsible for the aircraft. And it's kind of like a gradual ladder that you climb in the aviation community. Mm -hmm. So my first time in, in this role, I'm responsible for the aircraft. There's not like some more experienced guy there. It's me and somebody else's life in my hands. And we're doing new shooting techniques we haven't done before, and it's at night, and it's FLIR. So it's it's challenging. Mm -hmm. And two of the guys who were senior, two CW3s, both former enlisted infantry. One guy was a former Ranger, just badass. Great pilots, flew straight into the ground. They just, they got oh, what we no. have, we call it target fixation. They got fixated on a target and didn't pull out in time and just literally flew straight into the ground. Um, and I, I think for me, that was the beginning of this job could kill me. These are experienced people who I respect tremendously. I know they prepared, if not as much, then probably better than I did. Mm -hmm. And they still died. Um, that probably started the process of eroding both my feeling of Hey, I, I need to be okay if I don't come back and starting to lose my faith, I think over time. Mm -hmm. And then, so if that's the precursor was, I, I want to understand why, because something very similar happened to me and, and I, I, my faith has been restored, but there for a while it was gone. Is it, 
Is it what you heard over the radio? Is it watching just regular good people that you know are good people meet untimely, uh, tragic? Like, what is it that snapped in you to say that what what yeah. I believed I, before is no longer true? Or is it the cultural difference on somebody can believe something so opposite you and so fervently that they'll sacrifice their life for the same God that you don't believe in? Like, is it a little bit of that? Yeah, I will say, and to be honest, I don't think I really ever sat down and thought it through enough. But like, I have three sons and we don't go to church. And if you had asked me that when I was 25, I would have said, there's no chance in hell. That's my life. Mm -hmm. But it is. Um, I do remember one of the things that was somewhat disconcerting for me. There were guys in our unit who felt like we were on a holy war, mm -hmm. like a crusade. And I just didn't agree with that. Like I'd lived with the Muslims before. Mm hmm um some of the the shots that we had to take were like guys putting ieds in in the middle of the night and these are not your card carrying aq leadership these no, are guys farmers. who have families mm -hmm. you know who are mm -hmm. just trying to not get killed mm -hmm. and, you know and we're taking them out with these like long range shots um but i think there was a little bit of this oh, well, we're Christians and we're coming to invade. Like I've never, that never sat well with me. That didn't turn me off completely, but there was a little bit of that. And I do think it was a bit of, these are just good people who were good Christians and, and are gone now. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't know what it was really beyond that. What was it for you? Um, I think that um, Matt Hansen, Matthias Hansen was probably of the most religious young Marines in our entire platoon. S like save himself for marriage kind of yeah. believer, uh, good person. And when they get killed, what does that mean? And for me, I think it was a lot of culture. I think it was like I'm raised in this Western culture and I believe – you know, and my God and, and my God is a God of the people. And then I get over here and I see that the entire other side of the world is raping their own kids, offering their own kids up like sex slaves to, to the other people, you know, taking their own countrymen's children away and bribing them to blow up American. Like what? And you believe that you believe that so much. And I believe something so different than that so much. So it showed me that like in my life, I think I didn't have the, you know, the, the upbringing that you had. I didn't know a Muslim person. I didn't know somebody um, that was of a different religious culture than myself. And then when you go there and you realize these are regular ass people, they're regular people who just got taught something different than you. Um, and that was different for me. You know, uh, I think I've, I've got my faith back. Uh, and, and we don't got to go too far into it, but that was a struggle for me for many years trying to balance that and understand, um, you know, that it's going to rain on the just just as, just as well as the unjust. And, you know, yeah. I heard that growing up my whole life, never really understood it. And now I just have to level with it. I have to level with the fact that, that that's what's going to happen. There's going to be times that you don't like and they won't make sense to you. And guess what? It doesn't matter. You still have to go on and you still have to deal with what's in front of you and try uh, the best that you can to keep a pure heart th through it. And I think that's the hardest part about combat because um, I think in combat, in real combat, when you're in a gunship and you're firing to help troops and you're taking lives or I'm on the ground or, you know, somebody's on the ground taking lives, like you find out who you are. You, f yeah. you find out the monster that you really can be. And then if you can never tame that and control that, then I think it hardens your heart. I think that guys come back and I think they kill themselves years after the fact because their heart yeah. was hardened off, off of the things they did in their youth. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's very, it's one of those delicate things as a warfighter that you got to uh, keep in mind. And it's not so much like, a spouse to a God, but it is a spiritual endeavor that you will be on and you will be confronted with how you think about that when you go yeah. into those situations, I think. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, um, 
it's interesting to, to, to hear because nobody's been on my show or none of my friends that I've talked to have talked about that before, about why they thought maybe they lost faith or if they lost faith. So a lot of people are guarded about talking about that, but I think it's necessary to unravel that ball a little bit to find out where that goes. Yeah. And why that goes. So, so let's move past that. Um, I know that in, in my, this is, we're like in the Oh six time frame, right? Oh six, Oh seven, 2008. Eight. When I was in Afghanistan. Yeah. Eight Afghanistan. Okay. And it was earlier than that was Iraq then, right? So it was Iraq, then Afghanistan. Yeah. Check. So, from our last conversation, you said right around that 09 point is when you come out of uh, service, right? That's right. So is that following yep. that deployment to Afghanistan? Yep. Okay. So I come out of company command and I'm like, I'm just cutting all ties with the military. I want to go and just be in the private sector, which I know a lot of vets have done and very quickly realized that that wasn't going to work out for me. So private sector job paid well. What do you mean by private sector job? Flying? Yes. Uh, no, no, I just. Oh, you weren't flying. No. The um, So I also, I didn't grow up like wanting to fly. I didn't have this fascination with aviation. So for me, I, that was never a consideration to kind of continue on flying. It was, it was more like I'm going to cut ties and I'm going to go do something in business. And the Army has these programs for junior officers and senior enlisted where they place you in different companies. And then you, you just start a career there in a different field. Almost like so an internship or? A little bit. I mean, Placement. they know, they, they kind of, and the Army's not, I shouldn't say the Army. I mean, there are private companies that take junior officers and senior enlisted and know like, hey, if you were this rating and your fitness, you know, like your uh, evals, we can predict you'll be strong in these fields. Sure, sure. So yep. they've negotiated to have you land in a certain company that wants to hire a veteran who has a background like yours. So I interviewed at a bunch of companies and then ended up um, doing a sales job in the medical field. And I just, it paid really well. People were nice, but man, like it was 2009, 2010, Marja was like, I remember being in the airport reading about Marja and thinking, I can't believe I'm sitting here and that's going on. Mm -hmm. Like I got to find a way to get back to, to the mission. And so um, I put in my packet for the agency because I'd grown up in embassies overseas and my dad knew a lot of people from the agency, um, from the CIA. So to me, it had always been like, man, that would be cool if I could go do that. Sure. So I put a packet in and that's the direction I went. Sure. That's good. Now, was your dad affiliated or was he state department and just ha cross mingle knew a lot of people? Yeah, he, he was just state, but it's super common for state and CIA people to just be real close. Cause you're, at, you're at these embassies and all over the world together. Like you're mm -hmm. in the buildings together. Your kids are the same age. Yep. You live in the same areas. So you become very close with them. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Check. So is this like traditional, um, I, I respect the trade craft. I don't want to get into anything, uh, that, that we can't get into, but can you kind of give me a story or two, even if it's not your own, that would relate to what you did with the agency, uh, yeah. just to kind of paint a picture for, for, for my viewers. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so the agency is kind of divided between there are several components, but the main ones are, they call it the DA and the DO, the Directorate of Analysis and the Directorate of Operations. Analysis, they, these are your analysts. These are like really smart people on certain topics. They stay in DC at CIA headquarters and they analyze what's going on and they provide like strategic level assessments, intelligence mm -hmm. to the US government. The intel that they use to make those strategic assessments is derived from more tactical intel that's gathered by the Directorate of Operations. So when you see like movies about the CIA and you got like spies around the world, that's the Directorate of Operations. Um, so these are case officers traditionally who are out meeting assets, trying to, to get information that we can't get any other way. So we call that human intelligence, human. Mm -hmm. And they're feeding that back so that 
analysts can make assessments on, hey, what's going on in Afghanistan? And they're, they're getting little bits that are collected by case officers throughout the country. Um, so that's the director of operations is kind of, in my opinion, like the end, it's like the infantry or the NCO Corps. It's the backbone of the CIA. Mm -hmm. All of the leaders come out of the directorate of operations, like the majority of the leaders come out of that. Those are the people who are going to be chiefs of station, like the head CIA person in a particular country. They all come for the most part out of that directorate of operations side. So I was in that part of the business. And if people have seen like Zero Dark Thirty, um, where like where we find and take out bin Laden, a lot of that is touching on CIA tradecraft. You've got targeters, case officers, they're following people around, they're gathering intel. All of that sits in the DO, that side of things. So that's what I did. Um, and I've recently, I've interviewed a couple CIA folks on the show. I just uh, wrapped an interview with a guy named Jose Rodriguez, who was the, we call him the DDO the deputy director of operations. He's effectively the head of that DO. So maybe like the third ranking person in the CIA. Okay. Um, so he did that post 9-11. And actually right after 9-11, he was the head of the counterterrorism center. So he ran all counterterrorism operations for the agency <laughs> from like 2001 to 2004. So incredibly involved in all this. He very involved in enhanced interrogation techniques, um, taking out some of the key Al Qaeda leaders early on, like he had an instrumental role in that. The reason I bring it up is he was a career case officer. He's got a fantastic book. It's called Hard Measures, where he talks a little bit about the operation. So none of my ops are cleared yet, so I can't share them. Some of his go back far enough that they've been cleared. So for instance, he had he was telling me a story where he grew up riding horses and he's, he came from Latin America. Um, so when he was on a CIA assignment to a country in Latin America, he found himself riding horses. He wanted to find people who rode horses. So he used horses to work his way into the good graces of the president of that country. So the president would go riding with his entourage, two ambassadors, like I think he said the French and the German ambassador, and this guy, who's like the lowest of the low <laughs> American diplomats on the circuit, but can ride. So he got close to people who were important, effectively. Mm -hmm. I interviewed another guy who was a former PJ and then converted over to the, to the agency. And he was telling me an op where they were going after an HVT. They had to figure out where this guy would be. They figured it out and they talked to the lady who was the landlord for this apartment. So they recruited her and all this is in his book. So it's been cleared. They recruited this landlady to get access to the apartment. They bugged the apartment. And at the time, because of where they were in the world and the technology that was available, the CIA typically has like cutting edge technology, but this was a little farther back in time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm to get the information like the recordings out of the, the apartment, he had to physically be within a very close distance to it. So he had to hang out outside <laughs> of the target house. Um, so they collected this intel while the HVT was in the target house, but then the HVT left suddenly and bumped into this guy, the case officer on the street. And he's like, I had to go for my weapon and what you never want to have happen when you're on an op is to have mm -hmm. to draw a weapon. If you've done that, the op has gone wrong. Mm -hmm. So he's like, you know, a split second decision, didn't pull the trigger. It's a good thing. Like we went separate ways. It was awkward, but he had never seen him before. Like they had never met each other. We just knew who this guy was. Yeah. So it's just another example. I guess the reason I tell these stories is there's a lot of creativity and innovation and ingenuity that goes into that role. Mm -hmm. um, how do you get close to a person and convince them to report on the activities of their government or of a terrorist organization? Like, how do you understand their motivations and, and use them to your advantage? Like that's what you're dealing with all the time. So you have to have very creative people who can do that and who can go up and meet anyone. Like you can't just meet with nice 
officers in the military. You got to go and meet with some some shady people. Yeah, the from other time to time. the other end of the spectrum as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Exhilarating. I could I could I could see. I I, I definitely get the allure. Um, for sure. Um, but that's that's wild, man. That's uh, it's cool stuff. It's, it's wild. It's, <laughs> I don't know what else to call it. it it is. And I, I definitely, I found myself like without getting too deep into like details here, like, you know, I was a former army captain. So, so low on the total pole still, you know, I wasn't a Colonel, certainly wasn't a general level officer, but there were times where I would have to just because of what we were trying to accomplish with maybe another foreign government, I would go into rooms and, and like an army or an air force three or four star would kick out other generals so it was just like me a foreigner and our four star Mm -hmm. there and and so i was i was at there were moments where i was involved in like strategic events maybe i would call them that i just wouldn't have had that opportunity with in the military it would it would have taken me until i was like 55 years old to do that as opposed to when i'm 35 and because i i am the person who knows this topic the best, I have to be in the room for it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I kind of appreciated that. I've always loved the military and that experience I had, but this side of things like the agency and the Intel community had really sat well with me. Like it really resonated with me in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Now, this is a question out of ignorance. You, you're with the CIA for a period of time. And then when you stop that, do you, do you start this podcast? Uh, do you work a little bit in between? Yeah, good point. So I I work full-time still okay. at a big tech company, which people okay. can find on LinkedIn. I just don't typically talk about it on the air. Um, but my last job at the agency, I was in what we call our Center for Cyber Intelligence, CCI. Mm-hmm. Um, and I am allowed to talk about this. I had to get it cleared so I could go on the job hunt. And all I did all day long was go after like the biggest cyber threats to the U.S. government. So I was kind of steeped in cyber, the, in the cyber domain for two years. And then along the way, I picked up certifications in like penetration testing, ethical hacking, and that sort of thing. So because of that, I ended up landing in Silicon Valley running Intel teams for big tech companies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I say that because the podcast is what I do to stay connected to people like you and the veteran community and try to help, which is something I did not do when I left the military the first time and it was a mistake. Mm. So that's why I do it. But the the reason it came about, I think your your listeners might find interesting. I was deployed with the agency again um, in, in a war zone and I was away from my family. It was probably year four, if I add it all up, like training, deployments, everything. You know, I think I've been gone from my family for four years. And I know that's small compared to a lot of guys it's who a have lot, been though. multiple times. But like, it's still, you know, if somebody's been gone one year, it's that's significant. Still a it's a significant it period of time. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, like, God, I'm early 30s or mid 30s. And. You know, I've got three boys at home. I've got a wife who's trying to like hold down a job and, you know, I'm doing what I think is important. I'm helping, like I'm fighting some really bad people doing this work and, you know, who, who really understands what that's like for the people who, who sacrifice and do that, that that's where this came from. And I was thinking how many guys have been gone for 10 years? How many people have no relationship with their children anymore because they chose this life? Mm -hmm. And there are many. How many divorces are there? Like so many. Mm -hmm. Um, And there was just a bit where I wanted to share. I wanted people to hear that side of it, like a little bit deeper than just the cool war movie where there's a lot of shooting and high fiving. Like the the effects are longer Mm. lasting than that to me, I think. A hundred percent. And if I'm being honest, I wanted just one politician to listen to that, to one interview, one time. So when they make a decision to go do something and they've never served, which it's okay if they've never served, but I would expect them to be educated. And and I wanted them to hear some of the really tough stories that people go through with the decisions they make in a nice, comfortable room one day. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that's where the podcast for me came from. 
was wanting to do that. So it's beautiful. That's beautiful. It's a very similar, as you know, similar to, 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 to this, the reason of my show. I, I want to show that the spirit of core, that brotherhood, but I also want to bridge that civilian military divide where, uh, people don't think as much as maybe they should think when they're making big, huge geopolitical yeah. decisions for the rest of us. So, yeah, I applaud that. I love your show, man. Um, I, every <laughs> a little full disclaimer, I, I'm not very podcast oriented. Like I'm in my work, I'm writing, I'm yeah. recording my people. And, um, there's just so many good shows out there. There's so many good shows out there. And I didn't, I didn't fully know about yours until after we recorded. Um, and I love your show. A lot of my viewers love your show and have crossed over. Like uh, a big one was your um, uh, Top Gun pilot. Yeah, I loved it. You know, because it gives you it gives you more than that movie Hollywood thirty second look, and uh, it really puts a human face on these people in different jobs, right? Like. Yeah. Instead of just propping them up as this icon or this thing, you realize, oh, he has three boys and, you know, one of his one of his boys is in this situation. He's going through real life struggles just like you are because yeah. um, because people if you never meet your heroes, that's what it becomes. It's just kind of like an icon up here. But once you meet them, you realize they're just regular people trying to make it just the same as you are. And they're just, and maybe there's something to be taken from them. Maybe you can look at that and say, Hey, that person's doing it right. Or that person's doing it wrong, but you can definitely learn from anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned, I, I love that side of it. Um, is no, there, I appreciate that, man. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and your background there, the man in the arena is like uh, maybe a hallmark of a lot of our community's lives, you know? Yeah. Um, doesn't matter if you heard it the first time from the president saying it or, or from your dad growing up, when you think about those words that are on that piece of paper, for me, it brings something out of me. Um, yeah. and that's just the, I think that warrior ethos and mindset and protector archetype. Um, yeah. I think it's a whole lot deeper maybe than we know. Um, Ryan, I've had a phenomenal time. Is there anything that, we didn't cover that you would like to um man i know i said it when when we did our interview but um the insight into your experiences and i was just looking through i was like you know i'm curious some of the the comments that we got on that episode sure and one that really struck me was how appreciative at least this one person was but i think it, it spoke for a lot of the other comments there just how real you were about your what you saw and went mm. through and i know that's why people listen to your show because you are real and those are the those are the shows that end up getting the best response or people who are just kind of open and real about what went on so i would just say thanks for for what you did there and, and talking with me uh um that it was a side of of a battle i really wanted to dig into that played a, a huge role in me going to the agency. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for taking the time with me on that, on my show. Oh, and awesome. thank you for having me on here, man. Dude, every time we talk, I learn something new and I enjoy it thoroughly. So, uh, and, and I will say if I can just one plug here, um, one thing I've noticed on my show, people are very quick to, to support military veterans, which I support wholeheartedly less so to support folks from the Intel community and the agency. Hmm. And it does get a bad rap in movies, but to me, that agency, I felt like I was working with the same men and women that I served with in the, ar in the army. And mm -hmm. I met in the Marine Corps, in the Navy, like the, a lot of them come from those backgrounds, but all of them just are agreeing to get paid almost nothing, be away from their families for a long time, do a job they can't really talk about ever, um, to just help other people. And so I, I think my ask to your community would be, as you run into folks from that community, I, I would say it's appropriate to thank them for what they've done because they've been downrange arm in arm with us, um, with the military in Iraq, in Afghanistan. I'm sure like in Ukraine, they're probably, I hope they're just giving hell to the Russians <laughs> right now. 
I think yeah, they are. But they're there. Yeah. I did a uh, I did a show recently with a guy named Rick Green. It's out on my platform now, but uh, Rick was a State Department higher up in in Moscow for like seven years. He's lived in fifty different countries. He was a NATO arms inspector for nuclear and biological <laughs> chemical warfare, and uh, I just. I just sat down with him for 90 minutes. We're about to do another 90, but he's still getting battle maps and stuff of Ukraine. And, uh, you know, I don't know what all he's into, but he was very into that. He was very knowledgeable about that. And the numbers that he gave me, the sheer numbers of losses on the Russian side are insane. It's crazy. It's insane. It's crazy. But, I mean, we can talk about that for another three hours. Just that That's kind of the MO, right? They're going to throw... Yep people at the problem it's what they've always done so not to get it too much onto that man i appreciate you do uh Thank you from the bottom of my heart me matt the show my audience is uh they already love you they already know who you are um and so this is going to be great um guys until next time this is choices not chances louisiana gun shop your firearm headquarters specializing in concealed carry guns ammo and training you can get your Louisiana permit with us. Also, a large selection of AR-15s, or if you are that build-it-yourself type of guy or gal, we have all the parts to build and customize your own AR-15. Glock, Sig, Taurus, Ruger. We have all the brands, both in the store or at louisianagunshop.com. Not too far. You're marking a building. Yeah, that's good. That's a good shot. That's funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah.